It's not a number one uh, for uh, a friendly beast with two heads and four <laughs> hands. Pretty Just cool. a quick note about that. It's such a fun piece. That was a piece that Mozart and his sister Nanaro used to play in the 1760s as they were child prodigy duetting throughout Europe. So very cute piece for kids. I can imagine. <laughs> That's wonderful. And adults. <laughs> she didn't get enough credit. <laughs> okay. Dear God, help us uh, open our eyes to uh, what is truly true about our lives and your call of us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So, uh, we all know the disciples have been out fishing all night. Uh, they caught nothing. Uh, they're not disciples yet. Jesus tells them, put out into deep water, let down your nets for a catch. Peter says, we worked all night, caught nothing. But hey, you give the word, we'll give it a try. They catch so many fish, their nets are breaking. Would that the story ended there. With the tremendous catch of fish, the great success. Would have been so much simpler if they'd had a night of massive failure and then had the good sense to listen to Jesus and bang, their nets load up. Takeaway would be, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. A lot of the time, uh, the message of the Bible is dumbed down to something like that. But there's that line. Master, we worked all night and we've caught nothing. And if there is a verse in the Bible that we can relate to, it is certainly that. I mean, that is the universal conundrum of living, that you and I have spent hours, days, weeks, years sometimes trying to change something. And what do we have to show for it? We humans have a, a myth, in fact, attached to this, the myth of Sisyphus, right? What's life like? It's rolling a huge stone up a hill all day long, only to have it roll back where we started, and then we have to push it back up the next day all over again. Kind of like when the church reopened and we celebrated, and then Omicron came and we had to close our doors one more time. So what is your Sisyphean stone? Uh, an obstreperous child or or your, your uh, alcoholic brother-in-law, or, or someone who works with you, or something inside you like an obsession or a loss that you think you can live with, and then a new wave of grief comes over you, or some fear that won't ever, you know, go away. Master, we have worked all night, and we have caught nothing. So maybe we should just start, stop at, at, at verse 6, uh, the verse about their success. I mean, I don't want us to leave worship this morning more depressed than when we got here. But no, the lectionary says we need to read on. There is verse number 8. The story of Jesus' fishing trip doesn't end with the great catch. It says, but when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, get away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and everybody with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. So here's my question. Why would Peter have said such a thing? I mean, you'd think he would have been delighted what with this huge catch after a futile night. Dr. William Williman says, if you don't know why Peter said, get away from me, Jesus, then you don't know about the dangers of fishing with Jesus. Because let's be honest, there's something about us which is on familiar terms with fishing failure, which wouldn't mind if the story ended in futility. Something about us is more comfortable with fishing all night without a bite going to work all day with little to show for it. Now, why is that? I think it's because something in you, something in me, is content with Good Friday, but is scared half out of our wits by the uncertainty and surprise of Easter. 
I remember my father was given a diagnosis of terminal cancer many, many years ago. And then one morning they came into his hospital room and said to him, Mr. Delgarno, your tumor is shrinking. And the poor guy didn't know what to do with that news. I mean, he had expended so much energy getting used to the idea he wasn't going to be around very much longer. He felt he was being jerked around, <laughs> and he was. This often pops up in the world of work and, and higher learning. Uh, I'm speaking of, you know, the basic fear of success, achievement phobia. It's connected with procrastination and perfectionism and the counterintuitive impulse to quit when things are going well. Can you identify with any of those? Perfectionism, the counterintuitive impulse to quit when things are going well, procrastination. This turns out, this is not very rare. I had a roommate at the University of Oregon who was fresh out of Idaho State Penitentiary. He was very bright. He'd do very well with whatever he was studying. And then two-thirds of the way through the term, as if by clockwork, he would flame out every time, term after term. He didn't lose his scholarship because the state of Idaho felt it was cheaper to support him in school than in prison. But for Rick, that was his name, for Rick it was a case of serial self-sabotage. It's kind of the dark side of the fear of failure. The fear of falling maybe from too great a height. It can also manifest itself in people after they've achieved something great. Harper Lee had that happen to her after her first novel, the, To Kill a Mockingbird, won the Pulitzer Prize. She, she ended up not publishing another thing until an old, abandoned, pre-Mockingbird manuscript surfaced near the end of her life, and she let it see the light of day. You know, just six weeks ago, after a vote of thousands of New York Times readers, To Kill a Mockingbird was deemed the best book published in the United States in the last 125 years. 125 years. What is an author to do after that? Well, so in, in one sense, the book was a triumph, right? In another sense, it was a tragedy because it killed Harper Lee, the writer. Had it been a middling success or a modest failure, she could have regrouped and written something else, maybe, maybe grown as a writer in some new way. We can handle Good Friday. It's Easter. The deep waters of God's unimaginable, mysterious, powerful grace that scares the hell out of us makes us want to say, get out of here, Jesus. The harder work often, if not always, comes after success. Let me tell you a story about a young Methodist woman, fresh out of seminary, raring to go. We're sending you to this old inner city church, said her bishop. There are some wonderful people there. You should know them. You should know also that they are pretty old. The uh, church has been in decline for the last 20 years. There's, there's just a handful of them left. They won't expect much ministry from you. Just go there, hold their hands, and do the best you can. Well, she gulped. This was uh, not what her first position ministry was uh, supposed to look like. She had thought maybe she'd be an associate somewhere first, get some seasoning, run a youth group or something like that, not a whole church and have to bear the whole weight of it sinking like the Titanic on her watch. Well, she said to herself, so be it. In her initial meeting with the board, she could see the, the reality of what the bishop had described, mostly, mostly older women, a room full of white hair and pastel dresses, I have a gift for working with children, she told the board when they asked about her interests. Well, then the bishop has sent you to the wrong church, responded one of the women on the board. 
We're long past those years here. Yet in the days that followed, she noticed many children passing every afternoon outside her pastor's study window, children on their way home from school. They weren't the congregation's children, of course, but they were children. God, show me a way to do ministry I'm gifted to do right here, she prayed. Well, one afternoon she was visiting with one of the parishioners, an older woman. Tell me about yourself, asked the young pastor. The woman told a story about her early life, her career as a pianist in vaudeville in her youth. I played some of the best clubs on the East Coast, the lady said with pride. Count Basie, the Dorsey brothers, I knew them all. A light went on over the young pastor's head. Would you play for the church next Wednesday afternoon, she asked. Well, sure, if I can get these poor old bony arthritic hands to work, said the woman. I'll take an extra dose of aspirin. I think I can be ready. Pastor asked two women in the church to make peanut butter sandwiches. And on Wednesday, the four of them rolled the old piano out the double doors of the fellowship hall, doors that hadn't actually been opened in a decade. Gladys sat down at the piano out on the front porch of the fellowship hall and began to play. She played a melody of the things she'd played from the 30s and 40s, and then she moved into a little ragtime, and by 3.30, a crowd of children had actually gathered, and the pastor and her friends passed out the sandwiches. Gladys mood moved from in the mood to Jesus loves me, and the children came forward at the invitation of the pastor who told them a story about a Galilean peasant who was also said to be maybe the son of God, and then she asked them to come back the next Wednesday. And a year later, nearly 100 children were crowding into that old church every Wednesday afternoon, and on Sundays, Sunday school rooms were half full if not more, with children being taught by a group of older women who thought that they were now way too old for that kind of work. A few of those children brought their parents. Where there was once death, there was now life, Easter. And the administrative board met the next year, and they asked the bishop to move their new pastor. It's just not the same church, they said. Just not the same church. Jesus said, come out, out here on the deep water, cast your nets. And they said in unison, uh, we'd really rather not. Now, if you were an English major like, like I was, you, you may have been asked to read Herman Melville's little short story, Bartleby the Scrivener. Bartleby had no personality whatsoever. He hates the minutest change. His maddening refrain through the whole story when asked to do anything at all is, I would prefer not to. I would prefer not to. This kind of thing happens all the time, right? Remember the name Alan Turing. If you're a fan of Benedict Cucumber Batch, you probably saw the film The Imitation Game, all about how the nerdy genius Alan Turing broke the Enigma Code. Well, well, not only broke it, but figured out how to automatically translate every sensitive message the Germans sent in real time. The movie amped up the story quite a bit. He, he really didn't do it all unassisted. Still, he did get terrible pushback, garnering the support he and his cohort needed to, to do what they did. And then after the war, he had equally uh, terrible luck gaining the ground necessary to usher in the computer revolution he and others saw opening up before them. Add to that the fact that he was persecuted by his own countrymen for being homosexual. This was the man who, with the help of a few other bright souls may have shortened the war in Europe by two years, saving what, 14 million lives maybe. Get away from me, Jesus. Go home. In November of 2008, Barack Obama was elected president. 
remember how the former and now late Republican Secretary of State, Colin Powell, was bathed that night in tears. I saw it. An African-American man like, like himself had made it to the highest office in the land. It's over, Colin Powell said, meaning the 400 years of racism in this country had been turned back. It's over, he said, and he wept. But a large percentage of the nation said, get away from me, Jesus. And it's still saying that, louder than ever. Get away. Let us have our racist America back again. And it appears that a majority of white Christians in this country are saying that. A majority of white Christians in this country are saying just that, which, of course, makes me absolutely crazy. I mean, if we know anything at all about Jesus, right? But then Christians have always been the people who know the least about his heart, who don't really look into his teachings. I say this having watched and listened to tons of other clergy closely for decades. In regarding to the fact that America continues to struggle you know, with racism and its Civil War legacy, William Faulkner is remembered to have said the past isn't over. It isn't even the past. Better than that, the spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle, T-O-L-L-E, Eckhart Tolle was discussing Jesus' revolutionary concept of the reign of God some time ago. And he commented parenthetically, we have been repeating Jesus' words for 2,000 years, but who understands them? Maybe one or two Buddhists. That is not a joke. What I was just talking about is exhibit A for that. So let me close with this. It's one of my favorite stories in this regard. Shortly after World War II, during the reconstruction of Europe, the World Council of Churches sent three clergymen to several remote parts of the Balkans to see how their money was being spent. One of the three clergymen was Dr. John Mackey, who was president of the Church of Scotland. The other two, nameless now, were members of a, a severe pietistic denomination. One afternoon, Dr. Mackey and the others went to call on an Orthodox priest in a small Greek village. The priest was overjoyed to see them, was, was eager to pay his respects. So he produced a, a box of Havana cigars to, to show his pleasure. Dr. Mackey took one, bit the end off it, lit it, puffed it delightedly. The other two refused, saying they didn't smoke feeling he had offended them, wanting to do better, the Orthodox priest went off and brought back his best bottle of wine. Dr. Mackey took a glass, sniffed it, drank it down, praised it, asked for another. The other two, more horrified than before, drew back and said, no, thank you, we don't drink. Later, when the three men were on their way down the road again, one of the two turned to Dr. Mackey with a vengeance and said, Dr. Mackey, do you mean to tell us that you, the president of the Church of Scotland, smoke and drink? And Dr. Mackey had all that he could take. He turned to his compatriots and said, no, damn it, I don't, but somebody had to be a Christian. Do not forget Eckhart Tolle's injunction. We have been repeating Jesus' words for 2,000 years. Who understands them? Maybe one or two Buddhists. Why don't you come to my class tomorrow night? We'll talk about this. Buddhism, 7 o'clock on Zoom. 
The disciples have been fishing all night long. They had caught nothing. So Jesus told them, put out into deeper water, let down your nets for a catch. And Peter informed Jesus, we've worked all night for nothing. But okay, if you give the word, we'll give it another try. And they caught so many fish, they feared their net would break. And Peter, humbled to his very core, said, Get away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and everybody with him were amazed at the catch. And Jesus said, Relax, Peter. I'm going to make you into proper fishers of people if it kills me. Amen.